can register. To be in the house of the Lord and, and thank the Lord for bringing us through another week. Amen. We don't take it for granted. God has been faithful. He's been gracious to us. And it's just good to gather again. We started last week. We're going to jump in this morning. I won't keep you long, but I want to continue in our relationship teaching. We're in week two. Um, you can take out your uh, mobile device if you have version. If you don't, you can download it. It's a Bible app. And open, click on events, and hit Impact Church, and it will show you today's outline. Not just the scriptures that we're reading, but also a few of the points that you can make a notation of that will help you go back and study the word. We, um, well, let me just jump right in and then I'll, I'll kind of go backwards to where we were. But how many know when your relationships are in a good place, your life is in a good place? Yeah, when your relationships aren't in a good place, your life is not really in a good place because that can, can affect every other part of our lives. And so I think this teaching is, is quite necessary. Um, I know there's a lot of challenges that we face, and we, are, we show up in different places and different spaces uh, in different roles. You know, for some of you, you show up as mom, as sister, as wife, as friend, as daughter, or husband, or brother, or whatever it may be. We all have different roles in different places and spaces that we fill. And the best thing we can do when we enter into those spaces is to enter how we want folks to enter during COVID healthy. So every, relation that, every relationship that you have, the best way to enter it is how? Healthy. Come on, somebody say, say healthy. Yeah, we want to enter into those relationships healthy. So hopefully some of what we do over the next several weeks will help, help promote that and do something special in your life. I was preparing and I thought about um, something I've shared before, but it fits um, well here again. Uh, uh, centuries ago, the Chinese built a great big wall, and you know it is the seventh, one of the seven wonders of the world. It's called the Great Wall of China. And they built that wall not for what it is today, which is basically something to go see and tour and walk across, but they built it as a way of guarding their people, guarding their, their cattle, guarding, guarding their wealth, guarding their nation against barbarians that would come down from the north. And the crazy thing about it was that... Everything that they guarded was guarded by the wall, and the wall was built in such a way way back then that it was so high that it could not be scaled over, you know. It was so thick. It was so thick that it could not be penetrated through by the enemy, and it was so wide. It was 4,000 miles wide that you couldn't go around it, and so they made it, you know, you can't get into, you couldn't get into China back then. There was no planes, what have you, so they had that thing set to guard all their people, but the crazy thing about it was that within the first hundred years at the wall of the wall's existence, the barbarians got in three different times, broke through and got in three different times and, and came into amongst their people. And you might ask, well, how did that happen? Well, it was simple. While they guarded this over here with the wall and they guarded the thickness and the height and the width of it, the one thing they did not guard was the integrity of the guards standing at the gates. So three different occasions, <laughs> the enemy came and bribed folks standing at the gate, and they let them in. And, and that goes to say a point for us that, that oftentimes we spend a lot of our energy guarding things that are important to us. We guard our houses with alarms. We guard our cars with alarms. We, got, we guard our credit and put life lock and different things on our credit. We guard our passwords. But the one thing that we don't guard is our hearts. And the thing about the heart that you're going to find out is the Bible says that the heart essentially is the access point. It is the gate to get in every other part of our lives, including, watch this, our relationships. And so because we spend so much effort and so much time guarding these other things, but often omit to guard the one main gate in our life that gives access to all those other things, we wind up... Uh, going through painful experiences where we, we suffer hurt, we suffer shame, we suffer bitterness, we suffer unforgi un uh, uh, unforgiveness, we suffer with offense because the enemy comes in to steal and he comes in through the guard, through, through the gate of our heart. Listen to what Proverbs 4.23 says. It says, above all else, guard what? Above all else, guard your car. That's not what it says. It says... Above all, let's set your alarm tonight on your house. No, no, it says above all, it's good to put an alarm on your car. It's good to have an alarm on your house. It says, but above all those things, guard your heart. And he gives you the reason why. He says, for everything you do flows from it. It's saying everything 
that comes out of me flows from my heart. Everything that comes out of you flows from your heart. Every part of our lives intersects with our heart. It is the main gate. It is the access and entry point of our lives. As a matter of fact, one translation says, for out of it flow the issues of life. Every issue in life, including the relational issues and the challenges we have, flows from where? From the heart. From the heart. And when he talks about the heart, I want you, because I'm going to pick back up from where I was last week, I want you to understand that he's not only just saying the heart in a very generic way, but he's also including the attitude of my heart. The attitude of my heart. It includes the attitude of my heart. Last week, we started off in uh, Matthew chapter 5. And if you don't have the, the, the outline in front of you, you can go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Excuse me, verse 27. And what we found out last week was that Jesus is, is dealing with, uh, he wasn't just dealing with the people. He, he began to talk about this idea that, that the people, that his audience was, was angry and, and carrying this level of anger. And he said, oh, you think, you think that that's bad? He said, well, he says, you're upset about people who murder, essentially, but you don't understand that the anger that you carry in your, in your heart, Jesus said, was equivalent, ultimately, that your attitude was equivalent to the action of anger. And so we're getting ready to pick up on the next, um, well, let me go back. You may have remembered, if you were here last week, Jesus starts off his statements by saying, you have heard it said, but I tell you. How many, how many was here last week or heard the message last week? So let me, you have heard it said, but I tell you. What he's basically saying is you've heard all these years, it's been passed down, preachers and teachers, and in this case, rabbis have told you this. He says, but i got to correct some things because some of what you have is, 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 is misinformation. And, and what we said last week, misinformation, as you guys may be, be very aware of today, when you have misinformation, it can misguide your footsteps. I mean, it's unbelievable. You're going to have to explain to your grandkids how people in 2021 took medication that was for horses and thought they could use it against COVID. And you might say, well, how could somebody do that? Misinformation. Misinformation. And so what Jesus says is, you've heard all these things be said. And I need to remind you, Jesus, this is the Sermon on the Mount. So if you've heard, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be. Th this is the same sermon. This is another part in the same sermon. Jesus is, is giving a sermon. And he's saying, he says, he says, I need you to understand that misinformation is, is when you get either false information or incomplete information. So he says to them, you have heard it said, but I say. So we, what we're going to find out in this series is how does Jesus correct the misinformation that I have about relationships? How many of you did not go to school to learn how to have relationships? Nobody teaches you how to have a relationship. Nobody shows you how to have a relationship. Sometimes, if anything, they may show you some of the things that actually don't work. People will give you advice that doesn't work and, and tell you what they do, and you see, see them propagating certain things on TV. But the ultimate reality is that Jesus is saying to us, I want to show you how to correct your misinformation that you can move in a direction that's going to be life to your relationships. I'm talking about a relational reset, talks that turn things around. Are you ready this morning? All right. So what we find out that, that Jesus, in, in this text, what you're going to find out is that Jesus is going to deal with something that we have an issue with. And I need you all to pray with me this morning because I'm on a muscle relaxer, so I'm trying to keep it firing, all right? Uh, <laughs> but Jesus is, is getting ready to deal with something that we struggle with too. And that is this idea that I can compartmentalize my life. So it sounds like this in the 21st century. It sounds like I got my work life, my home life, my church life, my sex life, my money life. I got all these different lives. And what you're going to find out that Jesus says, no, you really only have one life. And what you do in your church life, your work life, your money life, your sex life, leaks over into the whole life. And what you're going to discover today is how Jesus wants to go below the surface of how we look and, and what it, it would seem on the surface and deal with the things that are beneath the surface that are destroying our life and making it not integral but compartmentalized. Amen? And how our inner world, say inner world, impacts our outer world. Yeah. So here we go. Matthew 5, 21. 
You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Now, th that was said in the law, so that's true, but it's missing some things. He says, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully. Oh, man, why did I go to church this time? I could have streamed today. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now it goes deeper. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. What are hard texts? And when you first read it, the first thing you're going to think about is that the only thing that the text is about is adultery. And what I want to show you this morning is that this text is not just about adultery, although it is about adultery, but it's about a whole lot more than adultery. It's about what happens in my inner world and how that impacts my outer world. Are you ready? So what we find out here is that Jesus is, is preaching to, and I'm going to tell you in a minute about the type of Pharisee because there was different versions of sects of Pharisees. Jesus is teaching and preaching to the Pharisees. And he's, he's saying to them, yeah, you heard that if you commit adultery, you know, that you should not commit adultery. He says, you've heard that. He says, yes. He says, that's a part of the truth, but that's not the whole truth. He says, you, you got some mis." information. So what Jesus begins to do is he says, let me expound on what you have heard. He says, I'm going to go back to the old covenant or the old law and explain to you that the intention of the old covenant was not just around the action of adultery, but the attitude behind it. Because what they were doing, you'll find out in a minute, was that in their mind, they say, oh, adultery is easy. That's cut and dry. It's either you did or you didn't, you know. And, woo, I didn't do it. I'm good. And, and it sounds cut and dry. But he says, hold up. But if you have looked at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery with her. Where? Where? In your heart. So what Jesus is saying, he, Jesus begins to equate an action, watch this, with an attitude. Oh, you missed it. Jesus says, if you looked on a woman with the intent to lustfully, to, to look at her in a lustful way, he says, that is the same as if you had committed an action. What he's saying now is, you have come saying, because these, these Pharisees want to be self-righteous, I've never done this and I've never done that. He says, hold up, but if you have thought this way, if you had this attitude, it was just like you had this action. Because, you know, we, you, and they did too, we view adultery as an action. How many I remember you, we've heard all about the woman caught in the act. The woman caught in the action of adultery. But Jesus now raises the stakes on all of us. He says, I'm not just talking about a woman caught in the action of adultery. I'm talking about a man caught with the attitude of, what, of adultery. I'm trying. And, and so you may say, well, it, we just sound so tight. We're going we gonna to help it. It's going to come together in a minute. But what he's saying, and it's this one takeaway I want to break down. I'm going to throw this out to you right now. In your relationships, action is the fruit. Attitude is the root. In your relationship, the action is the fruit. The attitude is the root. Oh, God. We often target actions, but Jesus targets attitudes. I shared this story. He just happened to be here this morning, so my kids all know they're always open for sermon illustrations. Amen? <laughs> but it, it, point, it painted a picture. I had to use a different one. So I never had a different one this morning, but I don't. And um, yeah, this I forget how old the boy was, um, probably about fifth grade or something. I don't know. 
Um, and he, we, you know, Christmas, I was tired. We had already put all this stuff and spent all this money. Y'all know when you parents, you put stuff together and you're assembling and you're arranging and you hiding and you uncovering it in the middle of the night. You know, you go through all this work. And so, you know, they all had their little Christmas piles. And so my youngest got his Christmas pile and, and he had, a, I mean, he had everything you could think of except there was one thing on his list that he didn't get. It wasn't an exceptional thing. It was just this one particular thing. And, um, and so he was happy at first when he saw his gifts, but when he didn't see that one thing, all of a sudden he was just pouting all day long, just pouting, pouting, pouting. So I just kept looking. I'm like, what's wrong? Well, I didn't get so-and-so, but you have this. So the day went on. Finally, by that night, he was just still pouting. I said, boy, you better get your attitude together. And he just kept right along pouting. <laughs> so I went and got every one of his Christmas gifts. I said, come here, bring them every one of them, and I put it right side, and we had, we had, in that house we had a, uh, an extra bedroom, I put it right on the top shelf of the guest closet. I said, you see all them gifts over there? Your birthday's on April 14th. You get it on your birthday. Merry Christmas. <laughs> and the reason why it wasn't to punish him, the reason why was because I was not after the pouting, I was after the attitude behind it. Because what I said to him was, I must have given you too much. Because whenever you have so much that you cannot appreciate what you have, it becomes what you had. And so we often are looking at, what you say? Say it again. When you can, I'll say it again. When you cannot appreciate what you have, it becomes what you had. And so as a parent, my responsibility is to prepare him for the real world. As a parent, my responsibility is to prepare him for adulthood. My responsibility is to prepare him for stewardship. And so it's not enough to train the behavior. You got to get behind the attitude behind the behavior. And that's what Jesus is after for us. He's not looking at the behavior per se because he knows that that is the fruit of a diff up from a specific root, from an attitude. As a matter of fact, actions always flow from attitudes. There's an attitude, there's a mindset behind every action that we do. This is so much larger than adultery. You know, you could sit there, and I've done it before. You know, you could go over, you know, I've had years ago, I remember in my backyard, it was, I think our first house, had all these weeds and stuff. And you could sit there and go over it with a lawnmower, but guess what's going to happen when it rains? They're going to pop up because you don't get rid of weeds by cutting them down. You get rid of weeds by uprooting them. you got to go to the root. And the action doesn't change. And the behaviors don't change in our lives. When we go for the behaviors themselves, it, go, it happens and changes when we go for the attitude that it's rooted in. In relationships, the action is the fruit, but the attitude is what? The root at the root. So we got to get to it at a root level. And this is what you see Jesus doing here as he's preaching. And what he's saying to them is, he's, he's saying to them, again, they're coming, the Pharisees are very self-righteous. And so it's this idea that I, you know, dotted my I's and crossed my T's and I didn't do so-and-so and I'm not like them. They did. I don't go out and step out. And I don't. So it's this idea that I have it together because you don't see me committing any of those things. Good, they was good at religious. You know, they had that all together on the outside. And when Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm not looking at your outside. I, I'm doing a, a, an MRI. I'm examining the inside. I'm giving you an x-ray of your heart to see where's your heart at. Because is it, if there's an attitude in your heart, it is as if you have done the action. Essentially, what he's saying to us, you don't have to do anything to destroy your relationships. Having a bad attitude is enough. Let that land right there. You don't have to do anything to destroy your relationship. Having a bad attitude is enough. Having a bad attitude is as if you did the action. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you this morning? Because in our mind, I'm safe, I'm good, I'm okay. I didn't do nothing wrong, but if I'm carrying the wrong attitude towards my son, if I'm carrying the wrong attitude towards my wife, if I'm carrying the wrong attitude towards my coworkers, if I'm carrying the wrong attitude towards my parents, if I'm carrying the wrong, he says, as if you did the action.
because every action even is rooted in an attitude, and every attitude eventually will bring the fruit of an action. Listen to what Matthew 15, 19 says. For, and it just confirms Proverbs 4. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sex, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. It comes out of the attitude of our heart. Those things come out of us. He said, he says, I'm going to take you back to the root. I want to get below the fruit, and I want to get you to the root because the attitude of my heart, and I'm going to be quick this morning, the attitude of my heart will either develop or destroy my relationships. So let me just give you a few examples from destructive attitude so that it's nice and pliable for you this morning. A heart that is unpleasable. In other words, no matter what somebody does to love, to correct, to serve, it's never enough. I said sorry. You should have said sorry a long time ago. <laughs> sorry that I didn't say sorry earlier. How about that? <laughs> I stopped off and got you flowers. You should have got me chocolate. Unpleasable. Right? Because underneath that is this idea and this attitude that that person should be able to be everything for you. And baby, can't nobody be everything for you but Jesus. I don't care how good they look. I don't care how fine she is. Can't nobody be everything to you but Jesus. Unforgiveness. Oh, this is one we know. Unforgiveness. You know, it just blows my mind. I, I couldn't believe that during the middle of a pandemic, especially at some of the hardest parts and hardest times, to hear people say, I ain't talking to her. Do you understand your life could be gone tomorrow and you're worried about what somebody said to you last week? You need to let that stuff go. How could you hold on to a fence in the middle of a pandemic? Unforgiveness is an attitude of the heart. Pride, another attitude of the heart. Pride says, I can't be wrong. I can't be wrong. I'm too proud to be wrong. I'm too proud to consider that I could be wrong. I'm too proud to get help and support. Y'all ain't going to say nothing because I don't want nobody to know my business. Uh huh. That's pride. Here's one we don't talk about a lot when it's out of the right context competitiveness. You know, this thing, it, it's almost like that TV commercial anything you can do, I can do better. It's like you're on the same team. Why are you competing against somebody that's on the same team as you? You know, the Bible, especially even in, in a, in a uh, spousal relationship, it is not a com competition. It's, you're supposed to complement each other. We're on the same side. You're supposed to have, if I got a weakness here and you got a strength, that should build up me up. And if I got a strength and you got a weakness, that should build you up. It's not about competing with you. How can we complement each other? I have, we had friends one time that um, they were both really sick, and um, they, they lived in Florida. These are, these are our friends' parents. They lived in Florida, and they had to get to New York for, for I can't remember which one of them needed treatment now. But um, the husband had cancer, right? He had cancer, and he could not drive. He was laid out. But the mom had Alzheimer's. So for whatever reason, I can't remember the medical reason, they could not fly to New York. So we were just in prayer with their children that are our age that the parents would make it from Florida all the way up to New York. The husband is laid out in the car. And the, and the wife don't have, she don't even know where she is. You know what? They made it. You know how they made it? Because she had the physical ability that he didn't have. And he had the mental capacity she didn't have. He gave her directions. She made it all the way to New York. That's what happens when you stop competing with each other and you start complimenting each other. You recognize that you have a strength that I don't have and I have a strength you don't have. And together we can get further than we ever could by ourselves. Uh, 
another attitude of the heart that destroys relationships, familiarity. That means when I first met you, I think you you, you the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> that means after some time, passers by, I think you're about as good as burnt toast. <laughs> it's the same piece of bread, but how you see it is totally different. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It's this idea that, that the longer we know each other, we don't esteem each other the way we used to. And that doesn't come from out there. That comes from the attitude of my heart. You know, it's, it, you got to be intentional. That's why the Proverbs says to guard your heart. It says watch with all diligence is another way of saying it. I got to watch my heart to see, wait a minute, am I starting to see you differently than I saw you last week? Because it doesn't, I told you before when we talked last week a bit about Jesus got on them about murder and anger because murder kills immediately, but anger kills eventually. That's the same thing, familiarity. It, it didn't just happen one day where you just all of a sudden, you know, I can't stand them. Because there was a point where you esteemed at one level, but over time it began to, because relationships, folks, they're dynamic, they're fluid. They're not, they don't just stay. They don't just wait. Let me say this. Relationships just don't wait for you to finish school. Relationships just don't wait for your body to be feel bad. Relationships still move. It don't wait till the pandemic ends. It's it's still moving. They're dynamic. And so what that means for me is that while I'm guarding everything else, I gotta guard my heart that while I'm going through the course of time, that I don't lose esteem for somebody that I had esteem for before. But how do I not? They get on my last nerve. You're gonna have to do what Jesus does for you. Look beyond their faults and see their needs. Come on, somebody. And I'll give you this last one, and because that, this one is what we see in this text specifically. This idea of being, this, this attitude of self-righteousness. I'm right, you're wrong. I'm right, you're wrong. And what we see Jesus saying is, that may be true. Maybe the person did wrong. Maybe they did commit an act from adultery to being late. Whatever the act is, the action is, that may be true. But just because they did the action and they're wrong, if your attitude is wrong, you are on the same reason. I didn't do nothing wrong, but that attitude right there that I just did, he said that's just as bad as what they did wrong. Whew, Jesus. Woo, this is hard work and hard work, Right? <laughs> it's like, Lord, but he says, I want you, you'll find that at the end of all of this, that the end of all of this teaching is that we look like Jesus. And God has this way of making us after his own image by using spiritual sandpaper relationships. So let me just break down for all the brothers in here that may be struggling this morning about this idea. If I look at a woman in my heart, what does he actually mean? By looking at in my heart. So let me go back first of all and say that the group that we're also listening to, this was a group called, I'd never heard of this before until I was studying it, um, Bleeding Pharisees. I said, what in the world is a Bleeding Pharisee? There was many different sects of Pharisees, but a ble Bleeding Pharisee was a Pharisee that was so obsessed with the idea of adultery and not wanting to commit adultery that these folks would put on blindfolds like this and walk around with blindfolds on. That's the dumbest thing you ever want to see. <laughs> Just dumb. And, and so maybe, not 100% sure, so, but maybe that's what he talks about, about the blind leading the blind, but that's a whole nother. And so because the bleeding Pharisees would have the blinders on and they would fall and hit themselves, and that's how they became called the bleeding Pharisees. Just dumb. Huh? You met something like, yeah, amen. And so... They were so obsessed with, with um, not being caught in adultery, because remember, adultery, unlike today, adultery was a capital crime. Remember that woman caught in the act that they were about to stone? They were going to stone her because it was a capital offense, worthy of death. So they were so obsessed with not doing the action, right, that they had omitted something about the attitude. So what Jesus says, he says to them, he says, if you even look at a woman, 
And what he's basically saying is if you get a bleepo, which is a Greek word, if you, can, if you get a little glance at the side of your blindfold, you have done just as much as somebody else. So really, is he actually talking about the, the side of the blindfold? No, what he's, at, he's trying to land a bigger point. He's actually saying is if you are living it in your fantasy, it's just as bad as if you did it in reality. Because watch this. Both have real-world consequences. And I need to just stop here. We think that only what I do in reality has real-world consequences, but also what I do in fantasy does too. And fantasy can look a whole lot of different ways. Let me just park real quick here. This is we're going into the 12 for a quick second. Fantasy can, can just like just what he's saying to him, he's saying just like adultery can kill your relationship, so can fantasy. And it's happening right now across our country and across our world. I'm going to throw this out to you right quick. 95% of men participate, have at least one time participated in viewing pornography online. How many know it's a big issue right now? Don't y'all feel a lot better, women, that it ain't y'all? But it is. (laughs) You know it's coming. Over 70% of women participate in pornography. Mm. Let me say a few things. Do you know the reason why, and I, I, I got to talk about this, we don't get the opportunity to, to gather the way we would like to, so I'm going to talk about it right here on a Sunday morning. The reason why men turn to pornography, the number one reason, because they feel safe from rejection. But they don't know that it robs intimacy. And the more you participate in it, the more it moves you from being intimate with the person that you want to be intimate with. That's what every study says. Women. Y'all need a lot of prayer. (laughs) I'm just trying to build it up so we can feel better. Work with me. Anybody, I know y'all don't read nothing like that around here. Anybody heard of Fifty Shades of Grey? Aha! I knew it was in the room. (laughs) Heard it. That thing has outsold everything in the world except for the Bible. Over 100 million copies. No other book, no other category. For those that don't know, it's, it's erotica. Uh, it sells this whole, basically what it's broken down is, is that it's beyond romance. It takes it to a whole other level of, of written pornography is basically what it is. Written pornography. And you say, well, whoa. And, and what this study suggests for women, why you turn to those types of things and this is hard because we live in a world that looks increasingly like this. When they turn erotica, they're looking for strength when men are passive. While society is telling you to raise passive sons. Just think about that. I'm going to let that just hang right there. But unless we think that when we, what I'm talking about fantasy this morning, unless we think that I'm only talking about in the sexual world, it could also be on social media. We have this tendency of thinking that our social media life is our real life. And I want you to know that the social real media life is a fake life. It is still fantasy. I got 5,000 Facebook friends. No, you don't. Fool, no, you don't. <laughs> you know, but it's this idea that that's my reality. That's fantasy. They don't care about you like that. They don't really know you like that. You don't know them like that. That's not real friends. That's not real people that are in your corner. They don't know you, but in our world, and, and as the next generation comes up, it is this idea that that fantasy world is my reality world. And it's so sad because what will happen is we'll put so much energy into those fake relationships that while I'm sitting having dinner with you, that's in my real world, I can't focus on you because I'm too busy focused on my fantasy life. And what Jesus is saying is don't let fantasy rob you of reality. You have real relationships. You have real people who love you. You have real people that live in your house. Don't let fantasy world rob you of reality.
Drop it. I can drop it. I ain't going to drop the mic, but I dropped my phone. <laughs> and, 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 we, and we do this in, 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 our, in, in the core, the deep recesses of our mind. Even the last part about fantasies is the ideals that we bring into relationships that, that, that you know, um, it's just when you see somebody else's husband, I wish he would love me the way he loves her. You don't know how he loves her. You don't live with them. All you see is the perfect version. You, you don't know, but, but it becomes this, this fantasy. And then when you get stuff, you know, pornography, other things, you have these, these ideas in your mind about a fantasy. Can I tell you that every time you have a fantasy, it, it's pretty much through the, through the filter of perfection. And so you have the perfect person, the perfect spouse, the perfect lover, the perfect friends. It's always a fantasy, and no one in the world can live up to your fantasy because no one in the world is perfect. And God has not called you to love perfect people. He's called you to love imperfect people. But the enemy wants me to give up. He wants you to give up our reality by this fantasy. You know, sometimes you hear singles say, yeah, I'm wait, I, I, the Lord going to send me somebody. He's going to send me. And I had a friend one time, she came up with so many things. She had, he was going to be, this is way back in the 80s. He's going to be making six figures. Mm-hmm. He's going to have four degrees. Mm-hmm. He's going to be handsome and fine. And she had a whole list. I said, well, what are you bringing to the table? <laughs> yes, we're still friends. <laughs> Because we'll bring our fantasy and put God on top of it too, y'all. And, and, and God's going to give us our fantasy. He's going to give you reality. He's not after giving you a fantasy. He's after giving you and teaching you how to love in reality. Because your perfect person, singles, doesn't exist. And for that matter, neither does your perfect husband, your perfect child, your perfect parents. So some of us that are still struggling with yesterday and where we came from, there are no perfect parents. For you, those of you that are here this morning and you're struggling because you feel like you missed this when your child was growing up and you didn't do this and you failed at this over here, there are no perfect parents. Release yourself. Release yourself from the guilt. Release yourself from the condemnation. God did not call you to be perfect. And yes, you missed the mark. We've all missed the mark. That's what grace is for. That's what the blood is for. Don't let fantasy rob you of your reality. Let me give you one way that this is just a quick thing that might help somebody. So when the enemy comes with a fantasy in your mind, it doesn't matter whether it's on social media or to pornography. It doesn't matter, really. Just once, I'm give you this permission, just once, then repent when you're done. Just once, follow the fantasy all the way through. You're like, that's what the pastor going to tell me to follow. Yeah, follow it through. <laughs> somebody got a breakthrough. <laughs> <laughs> Lord Jesus. <laughs> I wasn't ready. All right. <laughs> Pastor, what do you mean follow all the way through? <laughs> Go all the way through to it where you have the affair. Go all the way through to it when you step out. And then go through to the next scene. Go fast forward to the next scene. When, you ha- when you're watching your wife break down and crying in front of you. And then fast forward to the next scene as you're leaving your kids with your bags and your hands. And they're saying, Daddy, don't leave. See, that's the part of the fantasy the enemy doesn't show you. He only shows you what looks good. He doesn't show you how it ends. You, you better follow that thing through and recognize that I'm not going to let fantasy rob me of reality. I see what that looks like, but I got a reality that's so much better than your fantasy. And for God I live and for God I die, I'm not going to let you take what God has given me because I run out the fantasy. See, the devil doesn't show you that pretty fine thing when she's thrown up in the toilet. He don't show you those things. He shows you beauty and glamour and body. He don't show you all the fire that's behind it. You never see that perfect person suffer. You never see them sneeze. You never see them vomiting because it's always a perfect picture. So follow it through until it's not perfect. And I'm out of time, almost. So what's the answer? What does Jesus tell us about all of this, about our attitude, about the things that seem to be 
breaking us down and breaking down our relationships, what he says to us is, if that is you, if it's your right eye, that's causing you to stumble. If it is your right hand, that's causing you to stumble. He says he wants you to cut it off. Now, what is he saying here? Is he saying self-mutilate? That is exactly what he's not saying. What he is saying is, first of all, the idea, the fact that he went to right hand and not just hand, is sort of, you would have understood if we were there, we would have understood what he was saying was, in that culture, the right hand was the hand that was the preferred hand, and the left hand was the hand that was used for unclean tasks. I'll leave that to your imagination, praise God. And so how it would have read in the original, and they would have heard it, would have sounded more like this potentially. Better to leave behind part of our life that we are attached to that is destroying us rather than allow it to take us completely down. So what are you saying is, you know, well, let me give you a quick illustration. There's a movie called, I didn't see it, but I saw the preview, 127 Hours, where a gentleman was rock climbing and he fell. And when he fell, he fell, he fell into a big hole and fell and his arm got stuck. Problem was he was by himself. And so he could not get his arm out. And he was in there for 127 hours. The only way he was going to be able to save his whole life is to, was to cut off a part of his life. And so what Jesus is saying is you may have to cut off some things that you're attached to. Anything that you're attached to that's threatening to take your life down. Anything that you're attached to that's threatening to limit or to destroy your life. You may have to cut off some ideals out of your mind. You may have to come, cut out some goals and some expectations out of your relationships. You may have to cut out some fantasies out of your mind. You may need some of us, and, I'm, and this is what he's really saying here. Some of us, if this is what's going to cause you to lose everything, it's better for you to give your phone up. And I know how, I, 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 one time I was at the mall shopping for Christmas, and I ne almost never lose my phone, especially in public. But I went to one store, and I went to a restaurant after. I was like, oh, my God, my phone. In that moment, everything just, it was like, forget my wallet. I would have rather you had stolen my wallet. I was like, well, I got my wallet. I need my phone. <laughs> because this thing has been made so, we're so attached to this. And it's intentional, even the fact that you can put Apple, you know, pay and all those different Google pay. And you can have all, it's so that you don't let this thing go. Because this is the best way for me to market to you. It's not about you. It's about how they can make money off of you. But we have become so attached to it. It's like our right hand. And Jesus says, don't let this thing. You can live without your phone. But you're going to be in a living hell if you lose all your relationships. If you got to cut cable, cut cable. I can't believe it. No, no, do you understand what the price is? He said, it, it, he said, it's better for you to lose a piece of what you think is your life than to lose your whole life. You got to go back to a phone. Don't, don't let me come to church next Sunday and see everybody with a flip phone. That would be funny. <laughs> Take out your phone. <laughs> That would be hilarious. <laughs> My blood. So anyway, so what we find here, and I'm done. I'm just going to say this. It is a term that I, I love because it shows you the power that he's given you. I might be that person. You might be that person that's saying, oh, God, I got myself in a big mess. And I don't know how I'm going to get out of it. And what's in my heart is produce actions. And what's in my heart is, is, is built a wedge between me and my child or me and my, my significant other. And, and I don't know what you, God, will you get me out? And God says, Jesus says, well, I can get you out, but it's not the way you think. How I'm going to get you out is you're going to cut off the thing that offends you. I'm not going to cut it, but you're going to cut it. So what he's, a bit, what he's actually saying is I'm giving you the power to make the decision. So some of us are waiting for God to deliver us by miraculous means. And he says, no, no, I'm giving you the power to walk out your deliverance. So now, essentially, your deliverance is in your decision. Your deliverance is in your decision. If you, if you need God to deliver you from a fantasy world, whatever it looks like. It might be envy. It might be uh, 
comparisons. It might be the, the fantasy world of, of porn or erotica. It doesn't matter what it is because before God, the biggest thing is he wants our heart. And that's not a hard thing. The hardest thing is, is the part that it's got to happen to me where I say, God, I'm giving it. Y'all come on up. It's where I say, God, I'm giving my heart to you. And, and I, the cost of what you've given me in Christ Jesus is worth it. So you can have all of that. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how glitzy, how attractive it is. It doesn't matter how great it seems. I'm willing to lay it down. I, I'm, I'm giving up all the things that I thought I needed that I can make it and do what you called me to do. I want you to stand on your feet this morning. And I want us to just kind of walk out a, a surrender before the Lord. And I want you to hear what I'm saying to you this morning. This sermon, this text, which is a hard text to preach in my opinion, um, this text was not about Jesus condemning the hearer. This text was him saying, this is how you get from where you're stuck. You, you might have been stuck for 127 hours, but this is how you can still live after. This is a very redemptive text. It's not, he's not here this morning to shame you. It doesn't matter what it is. God is not shaming anyone this morning. What he is this morning, he's offering freedom. He's offering freedom. He's saying that the captives can go free. And that just because one part of your life has not been the way it needed to be, your whole life doesn't have to end that way. Amen? So can we just ask the Lord just to take whatever is hindering us and whatever is in our hearts, and you know it, what it is, and take a moment and just talk to the Lord this morning and, and give it over to him. Make, make that decision this morning, whatever it is. It could be a thought, it could be an expectation. Whatever it is, it's, it's probably not even very many, it, it may not be something tangible. But whatever it is, turn it over to the Lord this morning. Amen. that other stuff. I just want, I just want you. you. this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this moment in time, God. Thank you that we are here together, God, but not alone. Your spirit is present with us, God, and he is alive in us and willing to work in us. God, we ask first of all that you change the condition of our heart, change the attitude of our heart, show us wherever we have been deceived, show us the lie beneath the attitude, God, and deliver us from all bondage, God.
and everything that would cause us to stumble, God, according to your word, Father. We lay it down, Father God, and we lay a hold of true life, of pure life, God, of a holy life, God, of one that is God-pleasing and God-honoring and that's life-giving to our relationships, Lord. We pray that you build us up when we're weak and give us the strength, Lord, to cut off whatever needs to be cut off today in our lives, God, that it ends today, that no longer will the enemy have a foothold. God, we're guarding our gates. We're closing down the gates. The enemy should not break forth into our relationships or into our homes, Father God. We're guarding our hearts with all diligence. And we thank you, Lord, that we will eat the fruit of righteousness because of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Give God some praise in this house. Woo! Hey. You may have your seats this morning. Praise God.